بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم المحاضرة دي أول محاضرة في الرينال على الـ Glomerular Filtration Process دي الـ Learning Outcomes List of Learning Outcomes Describing the Glomerular Capillary Membrane Definitions of Glomerular Filtration Renal Plasma Flow Renal Blood Flow Filtration Fraction ال normal values what are the possible abnormal values determinants of glomerular filtration uh, the effect of the changes in the afferent and different arterioles on the glomerular filtration and renal plasma flow what are the predicted changes in the renal blood flow or, or glomerular filtration by increasing renal sympathetic activity also the effect of changes in GFR on uh, due to angiotensin 2 atrial natriuretic peptide prostaglandins nitric oxide and some uh, hint on the pathology related to or pathophysiology of the related to GFR especially in cases of diabetes hypertension or urinary obstruction <clears throat> so to start with very simply a basic renal process four stages filtration which happens across the glomerular capillary membrane reabsorption which occur across the whole of the nephron secretion which means that substances are coming from the uh, capillaries to the renal tubules uh, and excretion which is the final product so excretion is the outcome of both uh, filtration reabsorption and secretion so you, what comes at the end in the urine is the urinary excretion so these are the basic renal mechanisms there must be uh, details about each of these processes. Mahadra Lyum ala filtration mainly the specific part, the first component, which is the glomerular filtration. So, to start with the glomerular filtrate, what happened to the fluid when it's filtered across the glomerular membrane? Simply, it's very porous, very permeable membrane that allows almost everything to pass except proteins, large molecular sized proteins, and cells. Actually, it's not shown here, but the, uh, the cells means that uh, the red blood cells, mainly the main component, but any proteins, plasma, or any substances that are bound with proteins. Course. I mean, like calcium, for example, calcium, we have free calcium and we have protein bound calcium. The free calcium will be filtered, the protein bound calcium cannot cross. Similarly, ferrous, uh, the iron, which is carried by uh, also a protein, the transferrin, it cannot cross also the glomerular membrane because it is bound with a large protein. Protein hormones. Or large peptides and fats. This all cannot uh, cross the uh, glomerular membrane and therefore the filtrate that comes here at the end is similar to the plasma because it doesn't have cells and without the protein. So simply it is a protein free plasma. Uh, so any any uh, so if you if you take the plasma and uh, remove all, any proteins, whether they are uh, free plasma proteins or proteins bound with other substances, how much is is, is filtered? Twenty percent. So you have a blood coming here, the, 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 and then blood coming out. But in every cycle, only twenty percent is filtered. Of course, this filter, we will know that, that it, it will be, most of it will be reabsorbed. And the 80% will go. And the, of course, it will recycle and go back again and filter and, and so on. So it's a continuous process where you have 
renal blood flow, which is around 1.2 liter per minute. If we calculate it as plasma, because plasma represents a little more than half, 55% of the blood, then the renal plasma flow is around 700 milliliter per minute. Out of this 700 or 600 milliliter per minute, only 125, which is around 20% of this uh, plasma, is filtered every minute. If we calculate that per day, يعني if we multiply 125 by 1440, which is the number of minutes per day, هيطلع لنا تقريبا 180 لتر في اليوم. 180 لتر per day. This is the glomerular filtration rate per day. Okay? So, what is the structure of the glomerular capillary membrane? It's a, it's a complex structure, but it's very simple for passing. Uh, almost, as I said, everything. But there's uh, three layers. One that is vascular, which is the structure of the glomerular capillaries uh, from inside. So there is endothelial cells here. But these endothelial cells are different from other endothelial cells in the skin, for example, or in the brain, by being very porous, very permeable, because it has pores. فتحات or called fenestrations between these endothelial cells and these fenestrations will allow uh, uh, as mentioned everything except large proteins and cells then comes another layer which is a basement membrane this basement membrane is a meshwork of that is collagen and proteoglycans these are uh, 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 negatively charged structure, but it is a mishwork, shabak, that will also filter everything except proteins. But one important characteristic of being negatively charged is that it causes repulsion of uh, the negatively charged particles. Here, mainly specifically the plasma proteins, because plasma proteins are negatively charged. So it helps, it adds another dimension that it helps not only to remove large particles, but also negatively charged particles. The third layer, which is a podocyte, podocytes, they are like octopus, and they also have they are formed of pedicles, but there are also openings between these uh, 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 pedicles, and these are called filtration slits. Filtration slits. So you have the endothelial cells with fenestrations or pores. You have meshwork of uh, a basement membrane that is negatively charged, and you have also the, the podocytes that have filtration slits. All these, they help to make the glomerular capillary membrane, which is very permeable to all substances except large particles and cells. So this is the structure. Here you can see the, the octopus-like structure of the podocytes. And they are encompassing, surrounding the capillaries. Okay, and they have this. These are the filtration slits here between the uh, the pedicles of the uh, podocytes. The basement membrane is here, which is a, a meshwork, as I said, that allows or prevents filtration of large proteins because they are negatively charged. Just to remember also that the endothelial cells here, which is fenestrated, they are also negatively charged. So the, you have two types of negative yani cells that or structures that have negative charge. A basal membrane mainly, 
او اند اند دي اندثيليال سيلز بيكوز دي ار اولسو هافينج نيجاتيف ليتشارج بارتيكلز بات ذيس نيجاتيف ليتشارج بارتيكلز از اي سيد اور نيجاتيف تشارجز ويل كوز ريبالشن اوف دي اني نيجاتيفلي تشارج بارتيكلز لايك Proteins. So this is the fenestrations here in the endothelial cell. These are the filtration slits between the uh, podocytes and the basement membrane here, which has a meshwork with negative charge. So if we look at the effect of the size of the particle and the charge on the filterability, uh, well, uh, قابليتها انه تمر من البيزمنت من الجلوميرولوس وي كان سي فروم هير تو ثينجز اف يو لوك ات ذيس جراف كيرفلي ذيس از ذا موليكولار راديوس القطر كل ما زاد القطر كل ما الفلترابيلتي بتقل فيري كلير سو اف وي انكريز ذا سايز هير ذا فلترابيلتي بيكمز ليس ذاتس وان سكند از This is polycationic, means that they are positively charged. And you can see that they cross very easily because they get attracted to the membrane. But we can see here from the green uh, curve that polyanionic means that they have negatively charged. They, will, they are the least uh, to cross. So two, two important characteristics. The more we increase in size, like plasma proteins, the less the filtrability. The more we go from positive to negative, the less will be the filtrability also. So positively charged will go easily. Negatively charged will not be filtered easily. Of course, if it is neutral, it will be something in between. So the, the effect of the, uh, of the charge will not be a factor here, and then there will be only the effect of the molecular radius or the size. So what are the determinants of glomerular filtration? Two main determinants. One is the, uh, the as, as I just mentioned, the molecular size and the electric, electrical charge. These are the determinants of the filtrate composition. What will come eventually in the uh, pelvis of the kidney is, uh, the, uh, or what will go actually in the renal tubules is dependent on how much is the size. Big size will not go, small size will all uh, go easily. And the electrical charge. Plasma proteins are negatively charged, they will not cross. Positively charged, any particles with positive charge This doesn't mean that negatively charged particles will not cross because you have, for example, chloride ions. They cross very easily, no problem, because their size is very small, very minute. And therefore, they can cross even though being negatively charged. So we should consider the two factors. The size should be big and the charge is negative. This will not be allowed at all, like plasma protein. So, Then if the size is average, uh, but it's positively charged, then it can probably cross and so on. Now, how much, uh, what are the determinants of the glomerular filtration rate? Uh, <clears throat> and uh, that will be dependent on uh, two factors, the filtration pressure and something called filtration coefficient. Of course, of course filtration coefficient, part of it is the permeability and the surface area. So how much is the surface area and how much is the permeability? If I multiply surface area by permeability, it will be the filtration coefficient. Normally, it should be fixed a constant in a healthy adult person because the surface area of the capillaries should be the same. No change, so it was changed very, very little, and the basement membrane permeability should be the same if there is no disease. So healthy adults, they have standard KF, or filtration coefficient. Now, what can be actually changed physiologically, or of course pathologically, are the pressures inside the glomerular capillaries. 
and also the Bowman's curves. Uh, uh, hydrostatic and oncotic. Hydrostatic, who are caused mainly by the blood pressure. So we have capillary hydrostatic and we have Bowman's capsule hydrostatic. We have capillary oncotic uh, or osmotic pressure and the Bowman's capsule osmotic pressure or oncotic pressure. This is mainly due to plasma proteins. This is mainly due to uh, the blood uh, pressure. So alteration or changes in these pressures can affect how much is the net filtration pressure at the end, which will definitely affect the glomerular filtration. So to go in some details, glomerular filtration rate, what is glomerular filtration rate? It is the volume of filtrate or fluid that is filtered across the glomeruli per unit time, because it's rate. Rate means that you, consider, you should consider the time. So if we consider glomerular filtration rate per minute, so 1 to 25 milliliter per minute. So when we express GFR, please remember this. We should consider the time. Filtration means that per minute, glomerular filtration rate per minute. It's 1 to 25 per minute. If we want to consider it per hour, then you multiply by 60. If you want to consider it by day, it's 180 liter per day. So as long as you consider the time factor, then you are correct in defining the glomerular filtration rate. So equal to Kf by net filtration pressure, a Kf multiplied by filtration. Filtration pressure, as, I, as mentioned, there is a, a glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure, which is a pushing pressure, means that it, it helps infiltration. You have the blood coming here in the afferent artery that has a, a pressure, a high pressure of 120 or whatever. Once it goes to the capillaries, it becomes 60 millimeters mercury. That will help infiltration. Now, at the, on the other side, or on the other hand, you have a pressure, hydrostatic pressure also on the Bowman's capsule that will push the opposite side. These two are, are hydrostatic pressures. Uh, they all work against each other. And, and and it's caused by the because it's always having fluids there. The urine after it's formed, it will it, it it will not all go through the 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 bladder and the bimic urethra. They will still have some water there or some urine. Sorry. On the other hand, you have an opposing pressure caused by plasma proteins that will suck the fluid here and uh, uh, in the glomerulus. أي محمد أنا محمد زيك So any increase in uh, glomerular filtration rate will, will lead to increasing sodium delivery or concentration in the distal convoluted tube. And uh, that will, uh, will be sensed by specific cells, the macular densa. And these cells will lead to increasing formation of a chemical substance, mainly uh, ATP and adenosine. And adenosine, if you know from your cardiovascular system that it is a vasodilator substance in every uh, or every vascular uh, bed, 
except in the kidney here. In the kidney, it is a constrictor and it causes constriction of the afferent arteriole. And when the afferent arteriole is constricted, of course, that will lead to a, a decrease in the glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure and the GFR will go back to normal. And the opposite will happen if the GFR is uh, decreased. And uh, uh, um, that will, all, or, and also uh, ATP and adenosine will inhibit renal release by granular cells in the afferent artery. So these two factors that uh, they help in uh, um, adjusting the GFR according to the changes in the tubule. That's why it's called tubular glomerular feedback. So. Uh, that the, this is mediated partly by uh, we just talked about the afferent arterial and the cells in the afferent arterial which are called the juxtaglomerular cells and uh, these GG cells they are the ones that secrete uh, renin and they are also the they are affected by the tubular glomerular feedback just mentioned this is the macular denser cells in the distal tubule that since the changes in the chemical uh, composition of the tubular fluid and uh, they efferent arterial. The, the triangle that the whole afferent will efferent will macular densa with dolp is it's juxta glomerular apparatus. Of course between them there is uh, uh, there is uh, mesangial cells extra uh, glomerular mesangial cells that uh, also uh, help in uh, has some functions in controlling the uh, glomerular filtration. So this is uh, the, some in details of the uh, juxta glomerular apparatus, the macula densa. This is the afferent uh, arterial with the granular cells, and these are the uh, uh, J cells or mesangial cells. Now, how the changes in afferent arterial resistance affect the glomerular filtration and renal blood flow? It's a simple concept. If you constrict the afferent, then you decrease the glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure, then the GFR will decrease and the renal blood flow will decrease. If you dilate the afferent, then the pressure inside the capillaries will increase. That will increase GFR. If you, could, if you dilate the afferent but constrict the efferent, the GFR will increase, but the renal blood flow will decrease. And that will increase what's called the filtration fraction. Yani GFR ala renal plasma flow it will increase. The opposite, if you constrict the Afferent and dilate the efferent, the, ren the renal blood, actually, if you dilate the afferent only, then the GFR will decrease because the glomerular capillary uh, hydrostatic pressure will go down and then the GFR will decrease. But the renal blood flow will increase. In this case, the filtration fraction will decrease. But if you constrict the efferent, and dilate the afferent, then in this case, the GFR will increase and the uh, renal blood flow will also increase. And that will increase uh, uh, both of them. So how much is the balance or the difference between these changes? That will determine the filtration fraction. This curve is very interesting and, and, and it's also important. The effect of changes in afferent arterial resistance and the efferent arterial resistance on glomerular filtration. Afferent one is straightforward. You can see that if this is the normal, the renal blood flow, lower curve, where glomerular filtration rate is higher. And you can see that by increasing the resistance, the GFR will go down and the renal plasma. Very straightforward. Constricting the afferent, a little glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure, GFR ahead. 
And because we are constricting the afferent, the blood that goes to the capillaries will also decrease, so the renal blood flow will go down. But for the efferent, look at this. Uh, if you constrict the efferent, then what is going to happen to the renal blood flow? Of course, the renal blood flow will go down because we are constricting one of the vessels. So renal blood flow will go down. But the GFR, you can see that it increases until it reaches a certain limit and then it will decrease. So what is the explanation for that? The explanation is the following. If you constrict the efferent arterial, mild constriction, then the glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure will go up as we have seen in the previous slide. So glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure will go up, GFR will increase. But if you make too much constriction of the efferent, then what is going to happen is that the renal blood flow will decrease. GFR, of course, at the beginning will increase, and that will increase the filtration fraction. Filtration fraction, if the filtration fraction is increased, means that you are filtering too much fluid without proteins. And then the plasma proteins will become concentrated more in the capillaries. And we know that increasing plasma proteins will increase oncotic pressure. So it will suck the fluid uh, or, or will oppose the filtration force and the GFR will go down. Is that clear? Let me clarify again. Mild constriction, increasing glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure, increase GFR. Moderate to severe constriction, that will increase filtration fraction because renal blood flow will decrease significantly. So filtration fraction will increase. So you have more water in a way that is filtered uh, compared with the 20% that is uh, or normally filled. So the fluid or the blood in the capillaries, and the glomerular capillaries will become concentrated with proteins because you are filtering a protein-free fluid. So proteins will accumulate in the glomerulus. Oncotic pressure will increase. Glomerular oncotic pressure will increase. That will oppose the filtration, and this will reduce the so what are the vasoconstricting and vasodilating factors just mentioned? Sympathetic, renal sympathetic is, is very important. It releases uh, norepinephrine mainly, maybe dopamine. And circulating epinephrine also, all these are catecholamines. They are secreted by the adrenal medulla. Uh, uh, and they cause vasoconstriction by binding to alpha-1 adrenergic, especially norepinephrine and epinephrine to some extent. And they, of course, they decrease GFR, they decrease renal blood flow. And GTSN2 is produced systematic, systemically and also locally in the kidneys. It constricts both afferent and efferent, and it decreases renal blood flow and GFR. Of course, there are some details about it, if you see in the literature, small increase in angiotensin 2 will only constrict the efferent and not the afferent, and then the GFR will increase. But uh, I think for, for the time being, just take it like that, it constricts both afferent and efferent. Endothelin, a very important vasoconstrictor secreted by endothelial cells and mesangial cells, it is important pathologically because it's increased in many pathological conditions and it causes constriction of both afferent and efferent and then, of course, it decreases GFR. And the vasodilators, prostaglandin, as I mentioned, mainly the prostaglandin I2, which is prostacycline, E1 and E2. All these prostaglandins, they increase renal blood flow <coughs> by uh, uh, the vasodilating the afferent arterial and also antagonizing the uh, <coughs> vasoconstrictor effect of sympathetic and angiotensin. I will come to this later because this is clinically extremely important. Nitric oxide, endothelial derived relaxing factor, very important vasodilator. It, con it also counteracts angiotensin to anticatecholamine. Bradykinin, vasodilator, 
by the act by stimulating release of nitric oxide and prostaglandin, and therefore it increases GFR and renal. Dopamine is a catecholamine, but it's a vasodilator produced by the proximal tubule, and it inhibits rain, uh, increases renal blood flow and inhibits renal secretion. So here the clinical significance very important. In case of diabetes and hypertension. The renal production of nitric oxide in the blood vessel is decreased, goes down. And therefore, because it's a vasodilator, that will, uh, 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 sorry, it, it will actually be increased. It will be increased. And increased renal production will cause glomerular hyperfiltration. This glomerular hyperfiltration somehow, after pro prolonged, time or long time it will cause glomerular sclerosis and damage the glomeruli and can cause renal failure actually this is one of the pathophysiological mechanisms whereby diabetes and hypertension can progressively lead to renal failure okay so Di diabetes and hypertension, nitric oxide production is increased, glomerular hyperfiltration happened. That glomerular hyperfiltration will lead to glomerular sclerosis. Then the nephrons will die, and then the kidney will be losing more and more nephrons. And this is the mechanism by which uh, renal failure eventually will happen, chronic renal failure. The second clinical note is the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like aspirin, like voltarine, like ibuprofen, all these, uh, these substances, they act mainly by inhibiting prostaglandins. And I just mentioned in the previous slide, prostaglandins, they are uh, uh, vasodilators, they are important for uh, uh, counteracting the effects of uh, uh, they are important for uh, for for maintaining the function of the nephron, but uh, in case of renal ischemia or hemorrhagic shock, they are uh, uh, that there will be increased sympathetic activity, and uh, then uh, uh, that can lead to renal failure. But if you give, for example, patient who is coming to you in the hospital with the trauma or with shock losing blood, bleeding, and the sympathetic is highly activated, and already the kidney is, the renal blood vessels are constricted, but the prostaglandins, they are helping a little bit to reduce the impact of the activation of sympathetic on the kidney. If you give this patient uh, prostaglandin inhibitors or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, you are blocking one of the protective mechanisms where the kidney needs يعني الكدني بتتعكز على البروستاجلاندينز في الحالة دي وانت by, by giving this medication you are removing the, this aid or this protection to the kidney you may induce acute renal failure to your patient by giving the non -steroidal. so please do not give any non-steroidal anti-inflammatories to patients with uh, renal ischemia or patients with hemorrhagic shock. There is a case called renal artery stenosis. Patients will be given hypertension. And the, 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 these patients never, never give prostaglandin inhibitor because you are blocking one important mechanism for uh, protection. So we come to another important concept that needs to be يعني, يعني شوية, give me your attention to this because if you do not understand it now probably you will not understand it in all your life. Clearance is an important concept that have uh, clinical implications uh, on many diseases and many investigations, uh, especially related to the kidney. By, by, by definition, renal clearance is the volume of plasma that is cleared from a substance, 
per unit time. So look at this volume and the time. So uh, if you have a volume of plasma and you are clearing a certain substance from this plasma in a specific time, this is the uh, clearance. Uh, it, why it is important? Because it's important for uh, measuring the glomerular filtration rate or reabsorption and secretion of certain substances. So measuring glomerular filtration rate, measuring the renal plasma flow, renal blood flow, and also estimating whether uh, this substance is more reabsorbed more or uh, secreted more or something in the renal tube. So let's go to some details. The, if you have a, a jar like this with fluid inside it and you have concentration of four particles per liter in the fluid and you have a hole here and this hole allows water or the fluid to move and this fluid moves if you have eight particles from this fluid that is more and the remaining only the particles are removed and the, the remaining of fluid goes back to the jar so if i divide the eight particles by the concentration the concentration is four particles per liter meaning that i am clearing two liters from this fluid, from these particles. So I am taking out, I'm cleaning or clearing two liters from this fluid. So this is the clearance. So if I divide the amount that is filtered or removed from it by the concentration of the fluid, of the substance in this fluid, that will give me the clearance of the the amount that is cleared, but remember we are still not considering the time here. So this is an, a, a very important concept. So a concept that could be hypothetical because at the end, if you have a fluid, let's say you are putting a dye or something, uh, and then the, you are clearing, that you will still see the if it is a colored dye. Hatet sabga hamra. The fluid, if you remove the red ones, still the fluid will be red. But conceptually, you are cleaning or clearing two liters of fluid from these particles. So if, if I want then to consider the rates, yani flow or volume per time, and you have the same jar here, but you have a concentration, let's say, of 10 particles per liter. So this is a concentration. And you have a hole. And this hole is allowing the fluid to move in a certain rate. So this fluid, if I multiply the rate by the concentration, that will give me the number of particles per unit time, meaning that for example, if I have here, if the rate is 1.5 liters per minute, and I have 15 uh, particles, okay, so that this means that, so if I have 1.5 and you have 10 particles, this is a concentration. And you have 15 particles, so I, if I multiply the this the amount of particles, which is 15, by the concentration, the same thing that uh, we have seen in the previous slide. If I multiply, uh, if I divide the 15 particles by the concentration, this will give me 1.5 liter per minute in a unit time. So if I'm just considering the time, so the amount here is 15, the concentration is 10. So if I if I divide the, the, the amount by the concentration in the fluid, that will give me the clearance. Uh, and then the rate of the fluid will, it will be equal to the clearance, which will be here 1.5 liter per time, per minute or per hour. 
So the same concept here for the if we apply it to human body. If I consider the blood or the plasma as this jar, and you have the concentration, okay, which is P here of a substance, and this substance supposed to be, and you have a filter here at the hole, and you have this filter. This substance flows very easily across the filter. No reabsorption, no secretion. Of course, no secretion. It will not be affected, not altered. And then the urine concentration, which is the concentration of the flow, okay? The concentration in the urine. By the flow rate, this uh, means that you have uh, uh, around uh, 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 so if you if I multiply this by this this will give me the concentration or the amount that is uh, cleared or released so u by v this is the amount that is released or excreted and if I divide this by the concentration that will give me the clearance which in the previous case, as mentioned, 1.5 uh, liter per minute. So simply, if I want to know the clearance of a substance that is filtered freely, not altered, not affected, so if I know the concentration of the, or the, the, the amount that is excreted, and divided by the plasma concentration of the substance, then I can get the clearance of this uh, substance. So, go more into the application in the kidney. If I have a substance that is freely filtered, but not reabsorbed, not secreted, so no change here, nothing comes in or out. So, you are assuming that the amount filtered will be equal to the amount, the amount filtered will equal to the amount excreted. So the amount excreted is equal to the urine concentration multiplied by the urine flow. The amount filtered equal to the plasma concentration multiplied by the flow across the glomerulus, which is the glomerular filtration rate. So if I want to measure the, if, if I have this substance, then I can calculate the GFR. In this case, GFR will be equal to urine concentration multiplied by the urine flow divided by the plasma concentration. What are the substances that qualify for this? Inulin and creatinine. Inulin is synthetic. Creatinine is endogenous substance that comes from the muscle mass. It is stable, it is continuously produced, there is no change, freely filtered, both of them are freely filtered across the glomerular membrane, not reabsorbed, not secreted, not metabolized, not synthesized, and does not affect the GFR. So if I have substances that have these characteristics, so simply I can use the clearance of this substance to measure the glomerular filtration rate. Yani if I take this GFR and put clearance of creatinine, that's equal to GFR. Or clearance of inulin, that's equal to GFR. So, so glomerular filtration rate can be equivalent to creatinine clearance or inulin clearance. Because the amount filtered here equal to the plasma concentration of the inulin or the creatinine multiplied by the glomerular filtration rate. So if you want the application, if you have someone with the urine flow rate of one liter, milliliter per minute, plasma concentration of paraamine uric acid, one milligram per percent, which is per hundred milliliter, paraamine uric acid, 600 milligram, and hematocrit 0.45. What is his renal blood flow? So renal blood flow, in this case, paraminohybiric acid is a substance that is not reabsorbed, freely filtered, not reabsorbed, but completely secreted. It means that 
the renal vein concentration of the substance is zero. And therefore, the clearance of this substance is not equivalent to GFR. It's equivalent, actually, to renal plasma flow. So if I multiply the urine flow by the concentration, 600, divided by the plasma concentration, one, that will give me the clearance of paraamino hydroxic acid, which is actually equivalent to renal plasma flow, which will be 600. So 1 by 600 divided by 1 is 600. Now, I can use that because it's a plasma, and we know that the, 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 the plasma represents a fraction of 55%. Then if I divide 600 by 0.45, that will give me the renal blood flow or effective renal blood flow, which in this case will be around 100, uh, 1,200 or 1,100 milliliter, no, I'm not, no, more than that, 1,300 milliliter per minute or something like that. The second application, and I will leave this for you, and if you have any comments, maybe we can discuss it in this seminar. You have a woman who have, uh, in the course of measurement, she drinks a lot of water and then uh, she was given inulin synthetically, the infusion rate, one milligram per milliliter, urine fluoride before and after she drinks, well, a urine concentration 100, a urine flow one milliliter, after drinking water it becomes 20 and urine flow five. So, how, how much is the GFR before and after? And so, what is the impact of the increase in urine flow on the GFR? And explain your answer. So, please go through this exercise and then we can discuss it in the seminar. Or if you can communicate with me. So, what is the relationship between GFR and serum creatinine? Very clear. If the, geo, if the creatinine is filtered fleury, not reabsorbed, not secreted, and it represents the glomerular filtration rate, the clearance it represents the glomerular filtration rate, so there must be an inverse relationship between the plasma creatinine and the GFR, meaning that if you have low GFR, this substance will be retained in the plasma and it will increase. And the vice versa, if you have increased GFR, the, the, this substance will be cleared more and then you will have decrease in the plasma level of the uh, creatinine. So you can see that there is an inverse relationship. But remember, this is not a linear relationship. It's not like this. It's curvilinear, and this should have some clinical significance. So if the GFR is decreased by half, plasma creatinine is doubled, and the excretion will be balancing. So you have the amount excreted the same, amount produced the same, but the problem is in the filtration. If you have concentration, this concentration, this is a normal filtration of 180 liter per minute, then if you decrease the glomerular, if you decrease the glomerular filtration rate to half, to 90, then the concentration of substance becomes 20. 45 becomes 40, 22 becomes 80, 100, uh, 11 will become 160. So there is a clear inverse relationship. Now caution must be taken here. Now, this relationship is not immediate, it takes time. Anything in the kidney takes time. So, it takes time for any change in the glomerular filtration rate to affect the plasma. There is also effect related to the muscle mass. If you have a, an adult bodybuilder, he will be different from someone who is 80 years old and his muscle mass is very uh, small because creatinine is produced by muscle. It's an end product of protein catabolism, 
but it is not coming directly from the diet. It comes from the muscles. Make sure that your patient is not taking drugs that affect the tubular secretion of creatine. Otherwise, the, the relationship will be affected. Other than that, you can consider the plasma creatinine as a good, not a fine estimate, it's a rough actually estimate of the glomerular filtration. But if you, are, if you want a clear uh, relationship between GFR and serum creatinine, then you have to calculate the creatinine clearance, not the serum creatinine. So serum creatinine clearance is a measure of effective GFR. Serum creatinine by itself, it's okay, it's good, but it's not very accurate. So this is the end of the lecture. If you have uh, any uh, questions, you can uh, send me to my email. Uh, this is the main source, the Guyton and the whole 16th uh, edition. Okay, thank you.